Well, good morning. I'm not going to touch that mic. I know what will happen. It will uh, make all kinds of noise. It's uh, great to see everyone here today. I'd like to ask if you are uh, able and willing to stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. We're going to begin our services this morning as I read 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It says this, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come today and we come in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, the one who is greater than the enemy. Father, we are grateful to be able to gather in this place to sing praises and worship to you today, to hear from your word. And Father, I pray that as we hear from your word, as we, Father, I pray even before we hear from your word, as we worship, Father, I pray if there's anything in our lives that would hinder us from being ones who are merely singing songs versus one who is truly worshiping. Father, that you would hold our tongue until we do business with you this morning. Father, may we be sensitive to your spirit. May we be obedient to your spirit as we come into this time of worship. And then, Father, we pray for Pastor Matt as he will stand and preach the word today. Father, we pray that you would use him for your glory, that you would use the preaching of your word to bring conviction, to bring encouragement. Uh, Father, forever, whatever it is, wherever we're at today, what we need, Father, I pray that we would be sensitive to the Spirit and obedient to the Spirit in your Word today. So, Father, we're grateful to gather in this place and worship and sing praises. So, Father, today, uh, may you get all the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen.
for that brother Matt and I believe that there's a change coming church and I wonder do you want it to start in you if you do I'd invite you just at this time to bow your head and close your eyes because if a change is going to start in you it's got to start now and I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes and I want you just silently there to just think about the changes that need to happen in your life Sins that you find yourself encumbered in and snared in. Patterns, lifestyles, rhythms that need to change today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not when you get to it today. Heavenly Father, we believe a change is coming. And we want it to begin in us. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our minds. You know our weaknesses. You know our impulses. And Lord God, in Jesus' name, We want it to start in us as a church. We want to start in me. My brothers and sisters want it to start in them. And Lord, if it's going to start in us, it's got to start now. And so, Father, we surrender our wills to your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you are here. You came with us that are believers in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, we submit ourselves to the Spirit and to the Word so that your will might be done and a change may begin today. For it's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. And church, if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. If you've got your copy of God's Word, I invite you this time to take it to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We do have some guests here today with us, and we're glad that you're here. And we are going through a series. Our pastor, Pastor Ricky, is going through a series in the, uh, the book and the epistle of 1 John. So if you are visiting today and you don't like today's sermon, there's good news. The real guy's going to be up next week, okay? So give us one more chance. But we are continuing in this service, uh, this this, uh, series of light and love. And tonight, uh, today, we make our way in chapter three. This morning, we're going to look in verses one through ten. First John chapter three, verses one through ten. And our text today uh, talks about the Savior's appearing and appalling sin. He contrasts. The appearing of the Savior and sin's appalling nature. And as we're going to find our way here, I just want to ask a question. Have you ever found yourself in a situation? Maybe you just found yourself in it. You you, you didn't do anything to find yourself in it. You just, it found you. You know what I'm talking about? Or have you ever been in a situation that you found yourself in because you got yourself in? And it was a bad situation and you were looking for a hero. You were looking for the prince to come save the day. Kind of like in the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf there as uh, the, 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 the trolls and all are attacking Helm's Deep and Gandalf coming from the mountain, shining in white and there to vanquish the foes. Have you, have you ever just got yourself or seen yourself into a problem that you were looking for someone to come to make it all right? You ever been there before? I have to. I'll never forget the time that it happened to me. I know it's hard for some of you to believe, but I, growing up in high school and middle school, I was a amateur wrestler, and uh, not a wrestler, a wrestler. And uh, now I watched wrestling, okay, but I was a wrestler. And uh, if you believe that, I'm going to tell you something that you definitely aren't going to believe. I actually wrestled. 119 weight class. Some of you looked and said, have you ever been 119? 119 plus. I believe heavyweight queen, but not 119. I used to be the 119 weight class varsity in high school. And so anyway, I remember it was my uh, sophomore or junior year, excuse me, and uh, I was the 119 varsity wrestler. Uh, The guy that was above me was Mark Harris. He was a 125 pound wrestler state champion two times, and then above him was the 135-pound wrestler. His name was Dane Holbrook. Both those guys were bigger, stronger, and older than I was, and I was afraid of them because they like to just take it out on me. I'm a nice guy, and you know, uh, you think of me wrestling and that not be, but they would take it out, and they would cross-face me, and they would almost be like breaking my 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 elbows and everything else, and I was afraid of those guys. We're all varsity, but it, it was like they wanted just to 
hurt me. And I'll never forget that one day in practice, I was there, and, and I didn't mind wrestling the guys that were 109 and, uh, you know, uh, 99 and all those things. But those guys, I remember Dane Holbrook said, Queen, you're with us today. And they were gonna, they were gonna toughen me up, you know. And I was scared to death. My brother, who is my younger brother, I'm the oldest of three, my middle brother, Tim, he was a 145-pound wrestler. He was weighed more than all of us, you know. And uh, he saw, he knew that I was afraid of those guys. And when they yelled across the gym and said, Queen, you're with us in breakout, my brother heard that. And my brother came over and they said, no, we want Maddie. You said, you said Queen. They said, you said Queen, so you get the big Queen. And thanks be to God, my brother came to save the day. <laughs> and it's a good thing he did because my brother, though he was bigger than both of those, whenever Dane Holbrook took him in a practice, he head through him and right there broke his collarbone that very day. That would have been me. But my brother appeared right at the last moment to save me from a circumstance that I found myself in. You know, that's what the Apostle John is writing in this part of the scripture where he is very evident that in the Johannine community there in Ephesus that there is, uh, there is a, a group of people like there is anywhere, even here in Joshua, Texas, that really still struggle with sin. And uh, in that co community, there were some that were struggling with sin and knew it was wrong, and there were these false teachers who were struggling with sin, but it was no struggle for them because they didn't see any problem with sinning because they thought that the body is all evil, so the body just does evil things. It's really what their spirit is is what's important, and as long as their spirit's not touched, their body can do whatever they want to do. And John, knowing the predicament that we all find ourselves in, he references three times Jesus is appearing. Friends, it doesn't matter if it's Gandalf or Tim Queen, the greatest hero that will ever show up to rescue us from our bad predicament is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he appears and he does some things against our greatest enemy, which is the enemy of sin. And I want you to see what those three things are. First of all, we're gonna see that Jesus is appearing, his second appearing, as it were, Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. Second, we're gonna see in our text today that Jesus' appearing, his first one, takes away sins. Jesus' appearing purifies sins. It takes away sins. And Jesus' appearing, last we'll see, Jesus' appearing destroys the works of sin. Sin. Follow along with me in the text as we read 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 here today. See, John says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. So we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what will be has not yet appeared, but what we know that when he appears, that's that appearing language, we shall be like him <clears throat> because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin, sin is lawlessness. You know that, look at this, he appeared. In order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, no one abides in him, keeps on sinning, and no one keeps on sinning who has either seen him or known him. Little children, <coughs> let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he, Jesus, is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And by this, it is evident who the children of God, who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is the word of God for us today. John brings and taps into that innate feeling that we all have that we need a hero. We need a rescuer. And even if it's at the last moment, we want him to appear to make sure to make the wrong right, to defend us, to pull us out of what we need to be pulled out of. And John says to that innate feeling that's in all of us, I've got good news for you. And friends, the good news that he had for his community is the same good news that he has for each and every one of us here today. There is not just a hero who shows up to make the wrong right, who shows up to help us in our most desperate condition. He has already showed up and he is going to show up again. <laughs> and that's why three times he talks about this, his appearing, he appeared, Jesus appears and he shows up and he does something great against sin. The first thing that John talks about here that I want us to see and I don't want us to miss is that Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. Now, the first appearing that we're going to talk about here in verses 1 through 3 is actually a second appearing. It's an appearing that has not yet happened. It is an appearing that will happen on the last day. Whenever Jesus comes, he will split the eastern sky. Those of us that are believers, we will know that those that are dead in Christ will rise first. They'll be changed as quick as that in the twinkling of an eye. And then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to be with him in the air and so we will be with the Lord, and we will be not just with the Lord, we will be like the Lord. That, that's his second appearing. And so I want you to see what about his second appearing purifies us from sins. Look what John says here. See, the, the word here, see, is to, to ponder, to study, to concentrate upon, see, camp out on what Kind. The word what kind is a word that literally means a, a type that is of wonder, a, a type that is of astonishment. This word only appears in the Greek New Testament six times. And it's the same word that whenever Jesus is there on the sea and he calms the sea, you remember when that happens and he calms the sea? And the, 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 the disciples and those who are on the boat, they say, what manner of man is this? That what manner of man is the same thing. This man is wondrous. This man is amazing. This man is unbelievable. He can even stop the sea from its raging. See, pay attention. This marvelous what? This marvelous love. This marvelous love is uh, so marvelous. It is so wonderful. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And he says that we should try to, and we, but we cannot comprehend the depth, the width, the breadth of his love, the love of God in us. This marvelous, wonderful, abiding love comes from the Father. It's not just the love of God. It is the love of the Father. It's a personal kind of love. I'll never forget that whenever I was a college student at Mars Hill College up in the mountains of North Carolina, we had a, a contemporary theology seminar, and there we had a whole panel of homosexuals. There were two guys that came out of D. James Kennedy's church there in Coral Ridge, Florida, who were partners we had a Russian Orthodox priest who was homosexual. We had a 65-year-old lady who had left her husband for another woman. And then he had a Baptist minister who was straight but said there's nothing wrong with being gay. And I'll never forget what they said. They were telling us as a class, the Bible says, especially in 1 John, God is love. And that's why it's okay to love whoever we want to. 
And I'll never forget, I stood up in the class and I said, I'm sorry for some of the persecution, some of the way that some Christians have treated you because Christians should not treat you badly. They ought to speak the truth in love. But with all due respect, you're not trying to uh, apply the scripture that God is love. You're applying the scripture in 1 John as God. Love is your God. And friends, when we talk, God is God. That's who he is. That's what he is. But this is not just some generic God kind of love that the world would talk about. This is the love of the Father. This is a, a title here, not just a general God love. This is the of the Father. And he says this love from the Father he's given to us ensures that we are called children of God. Children of God. You, if you're children of God, you can't be children of God if you don't have the love of the Father, that specific love that comes only through Jesus Christ. And so the fact that we're called the children of God, this is a title of honor. This is a title of relation. We sang just a moment ago that in the, in the end times, who will bow down at the throne? All God's creatures, right? Right? Friends, all God's creation will bow down, whether they believe it or not, and confess that Jesus is Lord. But this is not talking about being God's creatures. We are God's children through faith in Jesus Christ, sent by the Father, established and sealed by the Spirit. And so the Bible says here that we are God's children, and he says this, and this is why the world does not know us because it did not know him. What is the world? The world is that evil humanistic system that governs the world that we have today. When John writes this in verse two, he's picking up on language that he actually writes in the Gospel of John, chapter one, verses 10 and 11, when he says, and he came into the world, and he made the world, but the world knew him not. He came into his own, but his own did not receive him. They did not receive him. And so it's the same kind of language. If they did that to Jesus, then they'll do that to us. And let me just say something to you, church here today. And, and those of you that are students that are going into the schools and those of you that are in the workplace and those of you that are retired and in the neighborhoods, if you are known and understood and accepted by the world, do you really know Jesus? because the world won't accept you. The world won't understand you if you're with Jesus. And so he says here, the world don't know, doesn't know us. In verse two, he says, beloved, we are God's children, not just in the future, not just when we get to heaven, but we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that, and here's a box here to highlight in your Bible, when he appears, that's the first appearance uh, of the, that three, that tri, tri, uh, uh, that, that tri, um, uh, three time view of appearing. When he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Our present situation as children is wonderful. But John says, our future state is even more wonderful. And what he says is, we will not understand what we will be unless we understand now what we are. That's why he says, we are children of God now. You have to understand that in order to understand. But when he appears, we will be like he is because we will see him. Our future state is predicated on who we are now. No one gets to a future state with God after they die or after Jesus appears. Friends, you and I have to deal with Jesus before he appears the second time. You know when that time is? Now. <laughs> it's right now. If change is coming and it's coming in me, it's got to happen now because Jesus has not yet come the second time. But when he comes the second time, and when the end rolls its way in, or when we die, there's not a second chance for us at that moment. Who we are now will influence who we will be in the future. And he says, when he appears, we will be like him, 
for we will see him as he is. What does it mean he'll be like him? You know, the Mormons, we've got Mormons in this area. The Mormons take this view and they think that we are going to be little gods. Excuse me. They say that the men will be little gods. That's what they say. And we will be like him, and and so we will become little gods. We don't become little gods. There's only one God in three persons, and it ain't any one of us, okay? Uh, There's a lot of us here, but it ain't any of us three, okay? There's one God, three persons, and it's not any of us. You know, in the beginning, God created man. And ever since that moment, man has been trying to return the favor to God and create us as gods, It doesn't mean that when we will be like him that we will become gods. No, the word here is a word that really means characteristic similarity. It doesn't mean that we're going to be the same essence. We're going to be the same weight. We're going to be the same function and everything else. It means really we are going to be like him in spiritual unity with the Father and in spiritual righteousness. We will have a body that no longer sins because he doesn't sin. Wouldn't it be glad? Wouldn't it be good when we are like that? So we will be like him when we see him, and we'll be like him just as he is. Verse three, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he is pure. What does hope mean? Well, that means my wife for me. (laughs) My last name is Hope. But what does hope mean? Most of the time when we talk about hope, we talk about some kind of wishful optimism or some kind of desire. I wish the cafeteria had pizza on Friday in school, you know, whatever it might be. I hope this happens. I hope this person gets... It's wishful desire. But that's not the kind of biblical hope that John is talking about here. He's talking about settled certainty. He's talking about confident expectation, knowing it will happen, though it has not happened yet. And what is this hope? He says, and everyone who thus hopes, thus hopes in what? Those hopes in three things. Our hope is number one in his appearing. He will come back. Our hope number two, according to this text, is that we will see him. He will come back. We will see him, even if we're dead, because there is a resurrection of the dead. And last, Our hope is becoming just like he is. Whoever has those hopes that he's appearing, we're going to see him and we're going to be like him. If you have that hope, it purifies you just as he is pure. Now, let me just say this. It is true, it is biblical to say that when we, when he appears and when he puts away this world and there's a new heaven and a new earth and we reign with him and we're with him forever and ever and ever, we will be different. I won't need glasses anymore. I won't, I, 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 I'll be able to eat all I want to and it won't show on my belly here, you know. Um, I, won't, I won't give out whenever I do a real, real, real quick dash or whatever. My knees will stop popping. There is a sense in which we get a new body, we're gonna be whole. But you know what? In American Christianity, that's all we focus on many times when we think about the second coming, about how we'll be better, better us's. But friends, let me tell you something. The glorification that happens to us in our bodies when Jesus appears is not just something that is for us to happen like we're just in trouble and pain and suffering now and then we'll be out of it. Friends, glorification is preceded by sanctification, which means though Jesus is the Savior sanctifier, he, in chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, he, with his blood, has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He did that in the past, but we still struggle with sin. And we must have a continual view of purifying ourselves because we know he is coming. Have you ever, were, were you ever one of those kinds of children? You don't have to say anything, okay? But were you ever one of those kinds of children that were doing things you weren't supposed to be doing? You're always on the lookout or had a lookout to see when mom or dad is coming home? Yeah, I, we, we've even got some today. We've got some of the children raising their hands right now. Yeah, that's, you know what? You're still like that. But the thing is, we need to be looking for his coming and we need to not be doing the bad things and having a lookout. We need to be right with him because he could come anytime. It'll come like a thief in the night. However it may come, it will come. And so the Bible says here, we shall be like him, we'll see him as he is. Whoever hopes in these things purifies himself 
because he is pure. Let me ask you a question. I don't think one of us here, whether you're a Christian or not, would not like to have a new body that never wears out. Thank God for that. But I wonder, when he comes back, are you actually doing something about the way you're living right now? Not that you just turn it on when Jesus comes, but it's turned on now. That a change is coming in me now. What are some things right now in your life that you need to be purified for? Not, not that you need to be saved again. Remember, uh, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, we confess our sins, he's faithful for us to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have been saved because of the blood of Jesus, but what are some things that since you have been a Christian perhaps, that you've picked up a rhythm, a habit, uh, something that you've continued to do, that you right now, the Holy Spirit, you know what it is. You know what your sin is right now. The Holy Spirit is it's right there before you, and you're trying to not even look at me because you don't want it to show on your face what it is. Friends, Jesus isn't going to just take it away from you when he comes. He wants to take it away from you right now. Today, will you submit to his purification, knowing that he's coming a second time. Because Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. There's a second truth here I want you to see. Jesus' appearing also takes away sins. Look what he says here in verse number um, 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 four. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Here, especially in verse 4 and, and also in verse 6, we, we, we pick up on what John is talking about and who he's talking about. Who continues to practice sin? Who is lawless in what they are doing? It's the false teachers. It's the Gnostics that have come in that have said, look, you can live any way you want to. You were saved. Your spirit was saved in the past. So just live however you want to because in the end, God's going to do away with your body and all will be left with the spirit and you'll be okay. And John is saying, no, if you have a license to sin, then you are a sinner. The fact of the matter is, is this sin is not, do you ever commit one sin after you're saved? I mean, when we're saved, we're always saved. But he's talking about here not just one sin. He's talking about, look at this, makes a practice of sinning. It's habitual. It's continuing on with no regard for anything else. He says, sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is a self-chosen disobedience to God, his authority, and his commandments. And so he says here, if you're making a practice of sinning, if you just keep on sinning, you're a lawless person. And you need to know, verse five, you know that, here's the second time, he, what church? Appeared. He appeared. Why did he appear? In order to take away sins. Because in him, there is no sin. Remember, Jesus was not just a spirit. It was not the spirit in the man named Jesus. Jesus was fully God, fully man. And in his full spirit and full flesh, there was no sin at all. And so what he says here is, Jesus appeared to take away your sins. Maybe you're here, and and when it talks about purification, you realize you've never been purified. So Jesus' second coming really maybe doesn't help you in terms of purifying yourself, because you've never, first of all, had your sins taken away. The appearing that John is talking about here is not the second coming. It's the appearing that already happened that we just celebrated in Christmas. Because when Jesus came, he came as God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. He died upon the tree. He took your sin, all the lawlessness that you practice and that I practice, all the practices and all the rhythms and all of the things that we do are wrong. He took all the sin and all the punishment for sin In his body, he absorbed God's wrath and he paid the ultimate penalty for sin and lawlessness and that was that he died. He was buried and on the third day he was raised from the dead and if we repent of our sins, that doesn't mean make a New Year's resolution. That doesn't mean just do better. To repent is to recognize I cannot save myself by doing anything. It doesn't matter if I keep my resolutions. It doesn't matter if I do just a little bit better. I cannot save myself. And then believe that Jesus is the only one that can save you. 
you can have your sins taken away because he appeared. He did so in order that he might take away sins. And so he says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Here's the fact of the matter. I love Jerry Vines uses a football illustration. I'm not as much a football person as I am a, a, um, um, a baseball person. I am, forgive me, a New York Yankees fan. And uh, I, whether you like the Yankees or not, you have to at least admit that Aaron Judge is a good player. And when you think of Aaron Judge, this great big home run hitter that's on the Yankees today, does he hit a home run every single time? No, but he does a lot of the time, <laughs> right? And so in the same way, what we consider as the top tier, professional, best of the best uh, t uh, players in the world, it's not that they always get it right, but they consistently get it right. And so as it is with you, uh, whenever, you know, uh, judge strikes out or something, that's not necessarily uh, the rule, that is the exception. And that's how it ought to be with us. Sin should be, uh, sin should be the exception, not the rule. And if you are here today and you find in your own life and heart that sin is the rule, you are a slave to sin, you are a practicer of lawlessness, and it really doesn't bother you, it is the rule, then you do not know him and you've never had your sins taken away. That's the bad news. But the good news is you can have them taken away today. Not because of this service, not because of the music, not because of this preacher, but because Jesus did appear in order to take away your sins. So that sin for you is not the rule, it is the exception. And so the Bible says, Jesus' appearing purifies us from sins. Jesus' first appearing takes away our sins. And I want you to see this last point here that John makes here. Uh, that's so important to us. It's in verse seven all the way to verse 10. Jesus' is appearing destroyed the works of sin. John says this, little children. He's not, he's not trying to beat up on them here. He's calling them little children. It's affectionate tones. And by the way, I may be preaching hard, but I'm saying this to you with affectionate tones. I love you. I'm trying to tell you the truth in love. I'm not meaning to be mean-spirited in this. Little children, friends, beloved, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Does it mean that you get everything right? Does it mean that you're perfect now? We're still gonna struggle with sin. But if you have a continual practice of righteousness, then you can know that Jesus is in you because Jesus is righteous. And the only reason you're able to perform any righteousness is because of Jesus. And then he says this, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of who? The devil. This is the first time that John, in this epistle, names the devil for who he is. Now, he is referred, I'm not saying he's not referred to the devil. I'm not saying the devil's not showed up so far in 1 John, but he's never been named as such, as the accuser of the brethren. John has referred to him. In some places, John has referred to him as the evil one, he also is referred to him as the spirit of anti-Christ, anti-Christ. So he's talking, he, he's describing him, but here he is, identified, pointed in the finger, whoever continues to practice sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Even before the world was made, the, the devil, his name was Lucifer. He was an angelic being. He was a heavenly creature of some sort. And he put it into his heart to try to ascend and try to get what God was getting. That was all the glory and all the honor and all the power. And God recognized that sin in his heart and he cast him out of heaven. He has sinned from the beginning. But not just since the beginning before time. He sinned at the beginning. Do you remember Genesis chapter 3? Adam and Eve are walking through the garden. Eve's not by herself, guys, so don't be blaming this on your wives. She has this conversation with this serpent and he says, has God really said you will not, not eat of the tree of this fruit? She said, well, that's what my husband told me. Has God really said it though? And she sees that fruit that is desirable and making one wise. And the Bible says, and she took of the fruit and ate it and gave to her husband who was with her. He was there too. That was his big sin. He wasn't 
help him protect uh, the sanctity of God's law in, in their family. And they took it. And he was the one who tempted them for sin. That's why we are continually having to battle sin to this day until we put away this body and take on one that is like his when we see him. But it's not just that. When he's there, he, right after that, and they're cast out of the garden, what does he do? He then gets sent to a brotherly scuffle between Abel the righteous and Cain the unrighteous. And he puts within Cain's heart what was in his heart from the very beginning, and he is, is jealous of Abel, and uh, Cain kills his brother because sin was crouching at the door. That same devil who, call, who, who, who led us into this mess, and we have to take responsibility for it, those who continue to sin are continuing to be influenced by the devil. For the devil been sinning from the beginning. And then we have this great text. All of all the Bible's great text, but I love this one especially. The reason, you want to know why Jesus came to the earth? The reason the Son of God, by the way, that, this is the first time that that phrase, Son of God, happens. It's going to happen a few more times. Pastor Rico will preach about it. But the first time Son of God appears, for this reason, the Son of God appeared, there is that appearing language again, was to destroy what? The works of the devil. And friends, what are the works of the devil? What do we call it? Sin. Lawlessness. Jesus is appearing. The reason he came the first time was to destroy the works of the devil. You know, a lot of people get it in their mind that, you know, uh, Jesus being tortured and being taken into captivity and being beaten and whipped and being on the cross, that that was all Satan's plan. And then all of a sudden, Satan gets surprised at the resurrection. That's not the case. Because the, the devil has been sinning from the beginning, and because he son, sinned from our beginning, do you remember what happened also in Genesis chapter 3? When God is pronouncing judgments, he says to the serpent, he says, you will be at enmity with the woman's seed. By the way, the only way that women can have seed is through a virgin birth, okay? You think of it. Through the woman's seed, there'll be enmity, you and her, and you will bruise his heel. Do you know what else it says? And he will crush your head. The devil knew it was coming. The devil knew the destruction to his lawlessness and his sin was coming to an end. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, having died for our sins, the works of sin were destroyed. Why do we go back to them? They're gone. Jesus appeared to purify us from sins. Jesus died to take away our sins. And Jesus died to destroy the works of sin. And so we're left with verse 10, which is a summary of what verses 1 through 10 is, and then is also a transition to what Pastor Ricky's going to preach next week, beginning in verse 11. By this it is evident who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Every person in this room, every person under the sound of my voice is a member of one of two families. You're either of the family of God or you're of the family of the devil. And friends, the identifying mark of what you are, you know, the reason I'm my dad's son is because I have his last name. That's the mark of me being a queen, is my last name. But the identifying mark of whether you're a member of the family of God or a member of the family of the devil is sin, if you're with the devil, righteousness, if you're with the Father. And then the proof of that, the evidence of that is, do you have a type of lifestyle where sin is the exception, not the rule? If it is, then you're of the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ, not because of what you do, but because of what he does through you. But if sin is the rule for you and not the exception, then you are, I hate to tell you this, you're a child of the devil. But the good news is you don't have to stay with that guy. He came, Jesus came to destroy his works so that you could be a child of God just like many of us that are here today. And so my question to you is, what does Jesus' appearing have in application for your life today? 
Maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're not, uh, you're not part of the family of God because you did something. You realize you couldn't do anything and only Jesus could. You put your faith in him and he's saved and you're looking for his appearing, but you've been looking for his appearing to get rid of your physical ailments and you've not been working right now to purify yourself of your spiritual ailments right now. And some of you right here, right now, you know you need to purify yourself of sin. You need to be ready because guess what? If he came right then, you can't deal with it anymore. You're going to stand before him with the sin you've been committing. And today, don't leave this place without purifying yourself of sin. We're going to have pastors right down here who want to help you, to encourage you to look to Jesus' coming if you're a Christian. And let that be a purifying motivation in your life to help you be who God has saved you to be. There are some of you here, though, that are not Christians. You've never had your sins taken away. You've never had them removed. You've never had your sins lifted. And today, Jesus wants to forgive your sins. As we've sung, as Dalton led us today, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you like to have your sins taken away? I, I, I want you to know our pastors are gonna be down here. I'll be around. We want to lead you into knowing how today can be day one of the rest of your life. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can look for, because of Jesus' first coming, and then you can look forward to his second coming, and from this day on, begin to purify yourself until he transforms you like him because we will see him as he is. Do you need to be forgiven of your sins, have your sins taken away? Do you need to have sin purified because you're a Christian last? Jesus is appearing, destroyed the works of the devil. Is the devil still working in your life? Do you know if the devil's still working in your life, he has fooled you? Because his sins and his works were destroyed back on the cross and from the tomb. And he's convinced you that this world system, that it's okay to live the way you're living, friends, would you today come and pray with our pastors and live in the truth that Satan's work has already been destroyed and live in that truth because of Jesus' appearing? Would you come today? Your sins, sir, your sins. Ma'am, your sin. Delis, your sin. Mark, your sin. And my sin. They are Wicked, but his mercy is more. Your actions are unspeakable, but his mercy, <laughs> his mercy is more. The patterns that you find yourself in, they seem insurmountable. They seem like you can't overcome them, but his mercy is more. I invite you here to the saved and to the sinner, to the saint and to the sinner, to come because of Jesus' appearing and deal with your sin today. Don't go on any longer. God wants to do something here today. So I'm gonna ask you, if you would, please, to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm gonna ask our musicians, I'm gonna ask our pastors to get in place. We're gonna pray. And as we pray, without even waiting, when you stand up, if you know you need to deal with God, pray with one of our pastors, just come up on the front and pray by yourself. This altar is open. If you know you need to purify yourself of sin through Jesus' second coming, if you know you need to have your sins taken away through Jesus' first coming, or you just need to live in the hope that the works of sin are defeated and destroyed because Jesus has come, I invite you to come as we pray about his mercy is more. Father, we thank you that Jesus appeared and that he will appear. And all of that, our appearing Savior will take care of our appalling sin. And Father, there's several of us here that are carrying it today. God, in Jesus' name, as we stand up, lead those that need to come immediately, not to wait, to do the change now, to come pray with our pastors, to come pray in the altar. And Lord, may you be glorified in this time and we give all the praise and all the glory to you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And church, if you agree to that prayer, would you say amen? amen.